So um, we are in the backstory, and uh, I'm Colby Cole, but it's a brand new season, a brand new season. And our first guest for this new season is someone who um, I've really respected over the years, someone who is a creative like myself. Being creative in this business um, is it's a special uh, trait to have. And not only is uh, this this gentleman a, a creative um, a musician, producer, label executive, he has been a part of so many interesting and amazing stories in the music business. And he has made history as an African-American uh, music executive. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to L.A. Reed. Hello, sir. Kobe Cole. <laughs> What's going on, man? How you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. I'm doing really good. Well, um, what's great about uh, you, L.A., is that you've had a dual career. So you um, you started off in a band. First of all, you're from Cincinnati. So let's take let's go back to Cincinnati as a kid. Could you have ever imagined the life that you currently have and all of the things that you have done in music? I mean, what was your initial plan as a kid? What is it that you wanted out of life? And and think about where you are now. Uh, yeah. Well, yes, I. Um... I feel very blessed and no, you can't, you can, some things you can't plan for, you know, you give your best work. Uh, you try to prepare, work hard and, 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 and the journey, the journey sort of takes on a life of its own. But yes, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. I was just there this past weekend because they've opened up the Cincinnati black walk of fame. So I was there, wow. I was there to support midnight star. Uh, because I I started my career in Cincinnati as a musician, and I formed I formed a few bands, but the the most noteworthy was the Deal. Yeah, and we signed, uh, we were discovered and signed by Midnight Star, and Midnight Star uh, took us to Solar Records, and they also produced our first album, and taught us how to write, taught us how to produce, taught us the game. Uh, uh, we picked up a lot of great work ethics from them, and so yeah, that was Cincinnati. Uh, but before that, in Cincinnati, um, as a kid, uh, there's a couple of things that that I remember that sort of registered with me that that really stuck with me. And one of them was like the first concert I went to, and it was James Brown, and it was wow. at Cincinnati Convention Center. And I watched James Brown, and I and I remember him coming out and doing "Say It Loud," "I'm Black and I'm Proud." And uh, I was blown away by James Brown. I was already a huge fan. Um, and that was the first time I saw a performance from James. And after the show, I remember just kind of walking around the building. As I'm walking down the street, Macy O'Parker is walking in, towards, toward, in my direction. So I stopped and said hello to Macy O'Parker. I must have been 12 years old or something like that. Um, but it just left an impression and and then i remember um a very famous record label from cincinnati is called king records and it's the label that james brown recorded for and it was located in evanston um, in cincinnati and i remember taking uh karate lessons at a at a karate school with victor moore that was very close by so when it was time to catch the bus home I basically stood in front of King Records to wait on the bus and I just stared at the building. I knew that it was a special place. I knew that this was the place that records were made and James Brown's name was on it and Bobby Bird and 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 I was just impressed with it all. I never saw a soul come in or out of the building, but I just stared at the building as though I was looking at the Magic Castle. Right. You know? uh, it was almost like Motown in Detroit. That's what was happening in that yeah. moment. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's my earliest sort of recollection of, of just being bitten by the bug um, of music uh, in, in Cincinnati, yes. But what was your vision though? What, 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 you know, you saw, the, you saw James Brown, was it, I just wanna be an artist? I mean, did you yeah. think about actually making music and maybe running your own record company or your own empire? Oh, God, no, not at that point, no. The only thing I thought about was um, how, to make, how to make music. At that point, it was just how to play learning how to play. I'm a drummer. Um, I used to be a decent drummer. Now I'm, I'm a mediocre drummer, but, yeah. uh, but that was really the idea was just to learn how to play and, and then meeting uh, other musicians and, you know, sort of one thing leading to another and you learn more. 
but it was about learning the craft first and foremost, like learning music and understanding songs and understanding performance and uh, who's good versus who's not good. Why, you know, why is this guy a much better bass player than this guy? Why is this guy a much better keyboard player than the other guy? And, uh, and listening to as much music as we could absorb, you know, I just devour as much music as I could. I listened to everything. Uh, but the idea and the plan was simply to be thorough and to mm -hmm. learn music, learn songs. And um, it wasn't work at all. I just did. That's just, you know, I'm a, I was a, a, a happy go lucky kid just loving music. So you had a group called Pure Essence. Talk to us about that group. It was one of the first groups that yeah. you were a part of. Yes, and Pure Essence was a group that uh, we formed with some friends. It started as a group called Mama's Pride, right? Mama's Pride, that was our group. We loved this group, right? It was a, it was musician, four musicians and three singers. And we would play in clubs in Cincinnati. Uh, one particular club was called the, the Clock Bar and we played the Clock Bar on the weekends, right? And I'm very young, I'm very young. I'm probably 14 years old or something like that, 15 years old. Have no business playing in clubs, but we were right. doing it. Right. And the group um, was really talented, right? And th there's one guy in particular named Dwight Tribble, who's a singer, a jazz singer now. He was in our group. And I remember after our final show, I didn't know it was the final show. And I went up to Tribble and I was making some joke. Um, and he said, well, you got it because this was our last show and he broke up the band. So some of us that were still in the band sort of morphed into what became pure essence. And, um, and it was five, there were five of us, myself and uh, KO, who is, who has taken the entire journey with me, KO, Kevin Roberson, incredible bass player, classmate, best friend. And we sort of took the journey together. Um, and we combined our group, the backup band for Pure Essence, we combined it with, I mean, for uh, Mama's Pride, we combined that with um, some other guys from another part of town and we came up with Pure Essence. And we were like, we were like Sly and the Family Stone, but we didn't have girls in the band, but our sound was very much like Sly and the Family Stone. And that was our idol and everything we did was all about Sly. And, um, you know, we listened to all of his records. We, we played some of them um, as a part of our set. And, and we were just really impacted by how great Sly was and how funky he was and all of his lyrics and, and the way he recorded. So, yeah, that was, and, and so eventually we recorded as Pure Essence and we did a song called Third Rock. And it was written by our guitar player, Stephen Tucker and we recorded it and you know at that time recording was very difficult Kobe. it was be because listen we we were poor kids from the ghetto we didn't have any money for recording studios there was right. no garage band back there there was right. no there was no there were no computers you know so uh you had to get money to record so we had a friend who's from cincinnati who was a professional baseball player his name was dave parker and Dave Parker, yeah. he played the Pittsburgh Pirates. It's a superstar. And he was a good friend. So he basically uh, paid for our session. So we rented a studio, Chillicothe, Ohio. We went in and we recorded two songs. One was called Wake Up and one was called Third Rock. And this is this is when the lessons began. So we took Third Rock. I mean, I'm sorry, we took Wake Up to WCIN to try to get it played. We didn't right. know anything. How you get records played on the radio. We just knew right. that that's what we were music. So right. we all of us drive there and we go in and we see this. We see um a, a a DJ. He may have been program director, I'm not sure. His name was Bob Long. And we went in and we played it for him. He listened to it with one headphone on. He listened to a couple of minutes. He said, No, nah, this won't cut it. This is not good enough. Um <laughs> he says, you know, it's just not, it ain't it doesn't have that thing. Right. So we were brokenhearted, like, man, we just thought we had it. We paid no attention to the second song we recorded. So one day I'm driving um, home from this factory job I had in Cincinnati very early. I'm driving home and I hear an, an, an ad on, on the radio. I'm listening to a rock station called WEBN FM. 
because I like rock too. I really like Jeff Toll. I like the Pink Floyd. I like Led Zeppelin. I like Jackson Brown, the Eagles. I love all of that. And I'm listening to it. And they, and they say, any local bands that have a recording that they would like to appear on our local uh, homegrown album project, bring it by the studio. I'm like, okay. So I drive to the studio. I'm in the neighborhood anyway, and I stop by, nervous, nervous. Never met anybody, and it's a rock station, so people don't look like us. Right, so and it's Ohio. Go, it's Ohio. <laughs> I go in and I give them the cassette right. of the song, and I leave my number, my home phone number. And a couple of days later, someone called from the station and said, hey, we love your song, and we want to include it on our on our album and we also are going to play it i'm sorry for that noise one second uh, let me turn this off sorry and they so i'm excited i called my band members bandmates and i'm not the leader of the band by the way i'm the drummer one of the youngest in the band really had no business doing it right um so next thing you know it's on the album and it's on the radio. It's on FM radio. It's on a rock station. The Eagles go off and Pure Essence comes on. Wow. I'm excited. I'm excited, right? Um, and so that was this, that was the beginning. And that was my first sort of lesson in um in all of it, and not only making a record, but also getting it played, you know. Uh, and it's all by chance. I had no idea what I was doing, but you know, I was a quick study. So how did that? that band turn into the deal or what happened with that band and then you end up in this other group the deal out of cincinnati so we took that band um on the road did some shows we ended up moving to indianapolis indiana and the reason was in indianapolis there were several nightclubs there that hired bands to play okay. the entire week so we found a gig at this at the club called the zodiac lounge and we started playing the Zodiac Lounge like five, six nights a week, four shows a night. I mean, we were working hard, really hard and loving it because we found ourselves at a very young age playing music for a living. No jobs, no nothing, getting enough money to eat, enough money to pay the rent. We all lived in one apartment and we played that. We did that for a long time and we became very complacent. We didn't grow. We learned a lot of music, but we stopped growing. And 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 one day, the turning point was we were playing at a club called The Night Flight. And it's one of my favorite stories ever. We were playing at this club called The Night Flight. The Night Flight is a discotheque. Upstairs is a discotheque. They're playing, they're playing um, Off the Wall and Saturday Night Fever songs. Downstairs is a little jazz lounge where the live bands play. We were playing downstairs for 15 people. There's probably 2,000 people upstairs, right? And um, the idea was that we were supposed to get people to come downstairs, but no one was interested. So right. one weekend, so we had a week off. I went to see the club owner. His name was Walt Manning. I went to see Mr. Manning in the afternoon, and I said, hey, um, listen, I, I want to get a little advance against next week's show so I can feed my band. And he says to me, well, there is no next week's show because you're fired. Oh, wow. And I'm like, why? He said, the reason you're fired is because your band is drab, you're boring, you're not playing the popular music, you're not attracting any people, and you know you need to do something because this is not cutting it. You, you need to do something, dye your hair, do something because you know, we had almost become like, we were almost like a, um, we become kind of like socially conscious and we were playing songs with messages in it and we were trying to be important, but we were basically boring. So he right. fired us. Mm -hmm. And when he fired us, it occurred to me that we were boring. So I went back, broke up the band half the members we were from cincinnati half of the members went back to cincinnati two of us myself and my bass player ko and my friend we stayed back and thought it through 
And I said, you know what we need to do? We need to break up this band and we need to go and find some members and recreate and reimagine this. So he and I went back to Cincinnati, thought about all the musicians that we known through the years, through all the singers. And we thought about this one guy, his name was Darnell Jones. He was in our, he was in our music class. He was in our choir and he was a really handsome, tall, handsome brother and very charismatic. And we were like, let's get, let's get him. We called him D. Let's get D right. in our band. Mm -hmm. So we got D, called him. He said, We're, I'm in. He called another friend named Carlos. Carlos says, I'm in. So now it's four of us. And then we call our guitar player uh, that from Essence. And we said, you should join us. Ultimately, it didn't work out for him. But uh, the four of us stayed together. And we went back to Indianapolis, only this time. We're, we, we're called The Deal. We changed our name and we changed our look. We, 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 we started, instead of instead of following Sly Stone, we switched. Now we follow Prince. Prince is right. our wife. Yeah. Right? So yeah. we did everything pattern after Prince. We did it all, Kobe. We had Jerry Curls. We had eyeliner on. We, we dressed in the colorful, flashy clothes like Prince. And we played songs like that. And everything we did was very Minneapolis influenced, although we never met Prince. We went right. back to Indianapolis to the same club. Only this time when we play, we get 50 people. Next night we play, we got 60 people. Next night we play, we got 75 people. By the weekend, we got 100 people. You wasn't born no more. We weren't born anymore. Yeah. Club owner notices it. We play that club for, we played the club for probably two months and we were packing it we were packing the club and we were feeling good and feeling better we saved up a few dollars and we quit and we went to one of our friends house and we just start writing songs writing songs writing songs recording them on a reel to reel recorder and just trying to make records and mm -hmm. uh and I, that's when our luck kind of changed so we came up with this song sounded really good and we had a we had a friend that worked for the post office that said he'd pay for our session so we could go record. So we get in the studio and we start recording it. And I'm like, okay, something's missing. I need a keyboard player. So I call Bo Watson, who was in Midnight Star. I said, Bo, can you come over to the studio and just help us out a little bit, play keys on the record? Bo comes over, he listens to us, the deal. He was like, this is good. He goes back to his band Midnight Star tells Reggie Calloway and Pablo Davis, who's the manager, they have something. The next day, the manager comes over and Reggie Calloway, they listen to us and they're like, oh, this is special. And they say, listen, we want to sign you guys to Midnight Star Productions and we want to help you make your demos, help you write songs, help you learn how to structure your songs better. And we'll get you a recording contract. We'll try. Right. So we, we record. And so then I walk into a studio for a midnight star session that's going on while we're making demos. And there's the lights are down low. They're recording a song called Play Another Slow Jam. This time make it sweet. Classic. Yeah. And there's a guy singing the demo, but the lights are dim. I can't see who it is. Comes out and it's Kenny Edmonds. And I met Kenny. And I met him when I was in Indianapolis and Kenny had actually reached out because he was interested in joining my band, the deal. Mm -hmm. And at, at the time he reached out, I didn't think he fit. So I declined, but I didn't know he was this guy. Right. So now I hear him singing, play another slow jam. He comes out and I'm like blown away by it. So I asked him, can he help us? Can he write for us? And can he, you know, and he said, sure. So he started helping us make demo tapes and we made a lot of demos. And when we finished, Reggie Calloway and Pablo Davis, they take the demos to to Los Angeles, to Solar Records, to Dick Griffey. Sound of Los Angeles Records, yep. Dick Griffey hears our demos. And, and I wasn't there, but he basically tells the manager and Reggie, I want to sign them. So without meeting Mr. Griffey, without leaving Cincinnati, 
without ever having been on an airplane, I get a recording contract. Wow. Sell our records, right? And we go into the studio after we sign the deal and we celebrate, we go out and, and um, we go to the studio and we record the songs. Reggie Calloway is our producer and we record a song called Body Talk. And the song comes out and next thing you know, it's like number 18 on the black charts. Dick yeah, that Griffey, was a hit. It was a hit. Dick Griffey yeah. calls, calls our house. Never met the man yet. He calls our house and he says, Antonio. Yes, sir. That record body talk. It's a smash. <laughs> right? And I'm yeah. like, whoa, I got a call from the head of a record label and just told right. me my song is a smash. Yeah. yeah. So now yeah. we're excited, man. And, yeah. and you're on your way. way. We're on our way. And the song continues to go up the charts. Then the manager calls and says, hey, I got a tour for you. Really? A tour? A real tour? Yeah. You're going to open for Luther Vandross. I'm like, wow. no. No. Wow. wow. It's going to be Luther Vandross and the DeBarge family. That was you a prime to tour right there. That was a prime tour. Prime tour. So now we're on the road and we, we, we're we performing every night with Luther and the DeBarge. We definitely didn't measure up. We were good, but we weren't as good as those right. guys. And Luther right. is arguably the best that's ever done it, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it was a great experience, it was a learning experience. And, uh, and we did the tour. And when the tour was over, and they released a couple more singles on us. One was called I, Girl, I Surrender. And yep. another one was called uh, Just My Luck. Right. And so we were on our way. And that's how we morphed from pure essence to the deal. And all of a sudden we had a career. And with the deal, you guys didn't last that long. So was it true that you kind of like broke up when two occasions came out? So the song was kind of released and you weren't really together when it came out? Yeah, we made three albums. Mm -hmm. The first one was produced by Reggie Calloway and Midnight Star. The second one was produced by Kenny Edmonds and myself. Okay. And it was it was the first time we'd ever produced. Mm -hmm. And uh and we were very proud of it and there were some gems on it, but it wasn't a commercial success. Uh so um we put it out, the label put it out. We went back out on tour much smaller tours um uh but with some notable acts uh we still we worked and it was great we still toured the country when it was over um we went back to start working on material for our third album and mr griffey calls me again I, obviously i've met him by now he calls me again and he says let me ask you something young man he said why do you still live in cincinnati ohio I said, well, it's my home. It's where my family is. It's where all the band members live. He said, well, think about this. He said, you can make more money by accident in Los Angeles than you can make on purpose in Cincinnati. I That's thought deep. about that. Yeah. Two weeks later, we lived in Los Angeles. Wow. <laughs> and so, so now we're on our third album. We're recording the third album. But while we're doing it, um, Babyface got a call from the Whispers uh, because they knew about him as a songwriter and uh, asked him to write for them. So uh, in our apartment, uh, he was working on material for them and uh, we started working on a song together. And the song was called Rock Steady. And um, so they hired Kenny as the producer and Kenny said, well, if you want me to produce it, you're going to have to have LA come also. Right. Uh, Cause he's my partner and they didn't really know about me and mm -hmm. they, they didn't embrace it, but they were like, okay, whatever, as long as we get this song. So Kenny and I go into the studio and we start producing the whispers and the song is coming out incredibly well, really, really well. And word is starting to get around Los Angeles now that Kenny and I are, producers and mm -hmm. and we have talent so we started getting more calls so we started working with Shalimar and other artists on solar before long other labels started calling us all of this is happening before we finished the deal's third album right this is in the middle of us recording our third album so we and rock city was a massive hit massive hit massive hit. Just, just get better than just better than time or that y'all did that one too right 
We didn't do that song. We only did two. We did In the Mood. In the Mood. I'm sorry. In the Mood. That's what it was. In In the the Mood mood and Rock Steady for the Whispers. Two big songs, though. Two really big songs. And we also, while we're doing that, um, we get a call from Cheryl Dickerson at MCA Records, and she asked us to come over and meet this young singer that she has from the Bay. Her name is Pebbles. Mm -hmm. So we go over and we meet Pebbles. And uh, we have this, we have some material. We have this one song called Girlfriend. And Girlfriend was um, a song that I promised to Vanessa Williams. And then um, after we met Pebbles, Kenny said, I'm not sure that song fits Vanessa, but I'm, I think it fits Pebbles. We should give that song to Pebbles. And I'm like, oh, I've already promised it to Vanessa. He's like, well, that's right. kind of your problem. But the song fits Pebbles. Right. So we record Girlfriend. MCA releases it. It becomes a smash. Now, yeah. Yeah. now we have two hits. And we go back and finish the Deals album. Yeah. And I put out, we put out a song called Can You Dance for the Deal. Didn't work at all. Mm-hmm. Dick Griffey says, you don't know what you're doing. You can't pick singles. Bring me the album and let me pick the single. Mm-hmm. We bring him the album. He hears two occasions. He's like, that's your single. We put out two occasions. So when you heard that, though, as you were recording it, you didn't hear the brilliance of two occasions in the moment when you recorded it, like, oh, my God, this is yeah. this is iconic. You, I you knew it? Okay. I, knew it was, I knew it was great. I did. I right. really knew it was mm-hmm. great. When we were doing it, um, I even remember when we were doing it, um, I wasn't satisfied with the first take of it and went back and improved it, right? And, like, mm-hmm. I knew it was special. But I thought... I thought because we had Body Talk as our first hit, I thought we needed another song tempo. that had tempo. Yeah. So and so I went I went with Can You Dance, Dead Dead Wrong, Dead Wrong. And uh Dick Griffey got got it right. We put out two occasions and it becomes a hit. But wow, that's a hit. So is Rock Steady and so is Girlfriend. Yeah. So now all of a sudden, all I'd ever bargained for was to get a hit. Now I got three. Yeah. Right? And your name is starting and, to be known in them streets. And my, yeah. And me and Kenny are like now, yeah. like, and we're the producers and the writers. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. now we have another career. So when mm-hmm. two occasions took off, we went on tour to support the record. And while we were on tour, we were, we were also still producing records for others. And we went back to LA to produce something and we missed our flight. We missed the flight. We were on tour and we missed the flight. And we could not get to, I can't remember the city, but wherever we were, we could not get there in time for the show. Right. So the band had to figure out how to do the show without me and without Kenny. I'm the drummer and he sings the big hit. Yeah. This this is a mess. So we finally do get to the show. 11 o'clock at night. The whole band is looking at us like, right. And at that point, I said, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I, 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 if I was committed to it, then I would never have missed a show. I would have never done anything to jeopardize it. And we started to have a new career as producers, which I liked a lot more. So basically, I decided I didn't want to be in a band anymore. Um, and we stopped. And, well, and, and, a, and a producer is more lucrative than uh than an artist at that stage right i think so i i think that's true but if you're really if you really are committed if you're like you know like the band we all love the group we all love was new edition we all love new edition like we Mm -hmm. they work hard they have great songs they perform well and and my guess is that they've made a lot of money right so i think that you can be very successful as an artist um but my passion switched I just loved the idea of producing people, you know? And so we started doing Karen White, then we did Johnny Gill, then we did Sheena Easton, and then we did The Boys and the Mac Band. We just started doing all these records for people. And we did Babyface's solo album, first right. one and the second one. Yep. And uh, so he was able to fulfill his dream of being a solo artist. And I was able to fulfill, fulfill my dream as being a producer. You mm-hmm. know, um, and that was that became sort of the end of the deal and the beginning of L.A. and Babyface. You also forgot to mention a Mr. Bobby Brown, who had a massive album 
along the way there that that shook up the whole music business and you guys you know i mean you had roni rock with you and uh every little step every little step don't be cruel cruel. like wow yeah roni rock with you every little step don't be cruel and then we did one called on our own for the ghostbusters Ghostbusters, yeah yeah and all of them became hits they all became hits and um yeah bobby changed our lives as an artist, we we ha- we were having some success, but it was really Bobby Brown's album that sort of cemented it, right? And uh, because my good friends Jimmy Jam and Terry, who I love dearly, right, really good friends, and my favorite producers in the world, they were doing um, New Edition at the same time as we were doing Bobby. So both albums sort of came out around the same time. So yeah, Don't Be Cruel is out, and If It Isn't Love is out, and you know, so I like the idea of being a part of that, that whole scene of New Edition and, and Bobby Brown and Johnny Gill and Bell Biv DeVoe and Jimmy Jam and Terry and Teddy Riley and L.A. and Face. Like, I loved the, the scene that we were a part of. Right. And it was like it's probably the most fun I ever had in my life. Yeah, You could argue at that time when you would listen to the radio, it was a combo of Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, you and Babyface or teddy riley at one moment it was just you guys and it was just like every song you you owned everything that was coming out yeah it was interesting too because we moved to atlanta in 1989 and i started listening to um v103 because i didn't know i didn't know the impact these songs was having i knew that they were hits because everybody was on soul train and and on and um and you could see the charts right but living in LA, I didn't really hear the songs that much on the radio, right? Um, I would hear I would hear Bobby Brown, but I didn't hear all of our songs. When I moved to Atlanta, I started hearing all of our songs, man, back to back on the radio. And that's when it really hit me, like, my God, like, wow, we're kind of having some impact here, right? Yeah, and yeah. It, that's, that's when it really struck me, you know, um, that wait, we kind of own to something here. So, so know, talk a little bit about, so, you know, historically we had, you know, in the sixties, we had Motown seventies, we had TSOP. So here we are in the eighties and the nineties and talk about you doing a deal and coming up with LaFace records and actually having your own label a, a lot like these other mm-hmm. iconic labels. And now all of a sudden, not only are you a producer, but you now have your own label. What was that moment like for you in your life? And, and could you believe that you were now the owners of your own label and your own destiny as creatives? Yeah, that was it was fascinating. And that that sort of dream came about um, as a result of having the success as producers and driving down Sunset Boulevard one day and I was just driving um i don't know where i think i was going to my apartment or something and i just started noticing something as i was driving there was a restaurant called la dome there was another restaurant called la tongue french restaurants and i thought la face la and baby face and that was it that's how it came it was just one of those moments driving down the street like wow um so we were, but as LaFace, I still didn't think of LaFace Records. I was just thinking of me and Kenny as producers. Right. And then Clarence Avon, the wonderful Clarence Avon, he started helping yeah. us. Mm-hmm. You know, he started helping us with our business and making decisions. And he said, You should start a record label. And I'll make all the introductions. You're making all these hits. You should be making them for yourself. Right. It like, makes sense. So we started LaFace Records. He introduced us to all of the the power brokers in LA. Everybody, we met everybody that ran companies. Mo Austin, we met David Geffen. We met um, Jerry Moss. Um, We met all the players. And we thought we were going to start LaFace Records with David Geffen because we liked him a lot. He liked us a lot. We had an incredible meeting and it's like, yes, the face records and Geffen just sounds right. And then uh, he had a change of heart and he decided that he he just had a change of heart. It wasn't a personal or 
it wasn't heartbreaking. It was just disappointing. So, so Clarence says, well, there's one more person you need to meet. Who's that? He said, Clive Davis. Wow. Now, now, now you touch the nerve because when I was a kid, I remember my friend gave me a book. It was called Inside the Music Business by Clive Davis. I read this book cover to cover twice as a kid, as like 18 years old, right? And so I knew who that was. I knew Clive. I knew that he signed Blood, Sweat, and Tears in Chicago. And he and he worked with Sly and the Family Stone. He worked with Miles Davis. You know, he'd worked with uh, Bruce Springsteen and Janis Joplin. And, and, and opened up a door for TSOP, too. He had the very first black music division at a record yep. company in support yep. of Philly, right? Yep. And Gambling Huff. Uh, yep. So, and even in that moment, he was at Aris Directors. He had, he had Whitney Houston, who was the greatest, the right. greatest. Right. So, in my mind, I'm thinking, if Clive wants to do this, it's not even a negotiation. It's a yes. And <laughs> Sure enough, Clive said he wanted to make a deal with us to start LaFace. And we did it. Why did you decide to go to Atlanta? What was it about Atlanta that made you all shift to move there from LA? It, was, it wasn't anything. We didn't know much about Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And we traveled to Atlanta doing tours and liked it as a city. Um, but we didn't love the idea of living in Los Angeles. None of us did. Myself, Babyface, Pebbles at the time, none of us really liked the idea of living here. So we would always thought that this was a sort of temporary stopover. So we had a discussion about it and we just decided that let's go to Atlanta. And we lit, so I called Irving Azoff, who was running MCA records, and we'd had a lot of success with Irving uh, with the acts at MCA. And I called him, I said, I have an idea. He said, shoot. I said, how does this sound? The Motown of the South in Atlanta, Georgia, LaFace Records. And he said, I love it. What do you need? I said, well, you need some money to move. He said, it'll be in your account on Thursday. And he, wow. he, he advanced us the money to move to Atlanta. Wow. And we bought homes in Atlanta and we were out. And when we got there, we didn't know a soul. We were living on the outskirts of town. We were, we did, there were no recording studios that we liked. There was one, there was one called Cheshire Bridge, but the owner wasn't very kind to us um, for who knows what reason. Um, and um, so we, Kenny, Kenny came up with the idea that we should build a studio on my property because I had a little, I had a, a little stretch of land. So we built a studio and we called it La Coco, named after my puppy named Coco at the time. And mm -hmm. we started recording our records at home and everybody recorded in that studio. Like everybody recorded their boys to men and Belle Bib DeVoe, Lionel Richie, I think used it. Um, and, and all of the acts that we found in Atlanta, Tony Braxton, Outkast, TLC, everybody used it. Uh, so we just recorded at home, but we had, we didn't have any, we didn't have a vision we just wanted to move to Atlanta. Yeah. And we went there, planted our, our, our flags in the ground. And because we were successful producers and Pebbles was a famous artist, and so was Babyface, we had a magnetism and all the talent in the city just started contacting us. So we opened up, opened up our office, started meeting talent, started listening to demos and interviewing people and auditioning people. and. And we kicked off a face without anything other than a name, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I remember your first group was uh, Damien Dame. I remember Damien when that Dame. came out. Yeah. For the first yeah. act, yes. Yeah. And they actually moved to Atlanta with us. They were living in Los Angeles, and they moved mm -hmm. there with us. Uh, and Bobby moved there also around the same time. Bobby Brown moved there also. Yeah. Um, and then we just started meeting people in Atlanta, and, and it grew. And it became yeah. something really moving to Atlanta is one of the, the, the things I'm probably the most proud of in, in my life. And just the meeting so many great producers and writers and artists and Atlanta has this thing, it has this style about it. Right. And, 
And the people in Atlanta, they they really like enjoy music. They dance. They have fun. Like, you know, New York and LA, everybody's kind of cool. Right. And right. a little bit laid back. People don't get too excited. But in Atlanta, yeah. people still people still let go, you know. So it's just great. So you have LaFace Records and um let's talk about TLC because I thought at the time when I first saw um their first single um and and left eye with the condom over her eye i was like oh wow this is a girls group and they i've never seen anything like this and i was in radio at the time and i remember meeting them you guys put them on this promo tour and they they were wild their energy was they were out of control and and i remember left eye because she was from philadelphia where i was at and um Tell us about that group because that was there. It was America is very conservative, and you guys just kind of changed the game with TLC, and you tapped into something. What what was that discussion like as you were creating this this group? Yeah, well, it was um, all kind of by chance. Again, Damien Dame was um, in rehearsal, and they had a backup dancer who was chilly. And her name wasn't Chili yet. She was Rosanda. And uh, after the rehearsal, she came up to me and she said, I can sing. I was like, really? Okay, sing. And so she started singing. And it struck me like, wait a minute. Pebbles has these other two girls, Tian and Lisa. And you're Chili. And you're, you look like them. I was like, I just said, you look like them. I was like... I called Pebbles and I said, somebody you got to meet. So she came to our house and she met Tian and Lisa and they just came together like magic, magical. And I looked at them all. I'm like, wait a minute, you guys are all like the same size, same height, same, same wit, same sarcasm, same colors. Like this is incredible. So th they became TLC. Pebbles named them, and and then they changed their name from Tion to T Boz and Lisa to Left Eye, and Rosanda mm -hmm. became Chili, and they were TLC, and um, and they they created all of that, like all of all of that, um, that 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 attitude, you know, the look, they created all of it. Like I had nothing to do with any of that. They did all of that. Um, I was behind the music, right? And they worked with Pebbles on imaging and style and all that stuff. That was all the girls, right? And uh, Kenny and I worked on music and then I brought in Dallas Austin, who was really the architect of the TLC sound. Although others recorded them, us included, it was Dallas Austin that was the real architect behind their sound. And it was a combination of TLC with Pebbles that was the architect of their imaging. Uh, but the attitude was all TLC. Yeah. yeah the charisma was all TLC. Um, and it worked. It worked well, like crazy. And that gave that gave LaFace Records a big jolt in the industry. Like all of a sudden you had this superstar girl group. Yeah, um, man. And then you come with Tony Braxton. Talk a little bit about Tony Braxton. You gave us a little taste of her on the Boomerang sound on the Boomerang yeah. soundtrack. Love should have brought you home. Great scene. The great way the song was placed in the movie. And then it's like, who is this this beautiful sister from Baltimore? What, what's going on with her? And talk a little bit about that project because you basically mm -hmm. created a superstar. Tony Braxton is one of my favorite people on earth. I love her. I mean, I love all of the artists that I worked with uh, and. And, and I, without exception, I love all of them, but I have a very, very special relationship with Tony. Um, I met her, we met her through Arista Records. She was already signed with her girl group called the Braxtons. Yep. But uh, I don't think that the label knew what to do with them. So we, we got a call from couple of executives at Arista. If I start name dropping, I'm going to get myself in trouble. So I'm just going to leave it at that. And mm -hmm. somebody's going to be mad at me. It's okay. Um, 
they came down and they auditioned for us at a club. And Kenny and I are watching the girls. And then Tony steps out. She sits down at the piano and she's playing the piano and she's talking. And then she starts singing. And I looked at Kenny and Kenny looked at me and it was like her, her. So afterwards, um, I offered her a deal with LaFace. And she was like, great, me and my sisters, right? Nope, you. So as I learned many years later, that was a very, very difficult moment for her. Yeah, I didn't. Even, I didn't even appreciate how difficult that must have been. Yeah, but um, but she 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 molded over. Eventually, she made a decision to sign with the label. So uh, and we didn't have any plan. Just sign her, and we'll eventually get some records made. So her and her manager asked for a meeting. So I got great. So we went out to dinner at a restaurant in Atlanta. And the manager says, so what is your plan for Tony? And Kobe, this is, this is when I became a record executive. It was that mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. I had no plan, but I had to give an answer. So I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to record you on a soundtrack. And we're going to release your first single on a soundtrack, get you hot. And then we're going to make your album. I didn't have no soundtrack. <laughs> I didn't even know how to get a soundtrack. I'm a, I'm a producer. Right. I don't even know. I know nothing about it. I don't know. What do you do? What do you, who do you call? Right. I didn't know anything, man. I was just improvising and being spontaneous, mm -hmm. but I spoke it. And then I saw, um, and they bought it. They were like, okay, great. I was like, okay, now I got to make this happen. Right. So Cassandra Mills was working for Giant Records and had this incredible soundtrack to New Jack City. So I called Cassandra, who's a friend, and I asked Cassandra, how do you go about getting a soundtrack? <laughs> right. And she said, well, you know what you should do? You should call the Hutland brothers because they're producing a movie with Eddie Murphy called Boomerang. It's like, okay. I called the Hutland brothers just as she recommended. And I talked to them and they said, okay, great. Come to Los Angeles. I mean, come to New York and meet us. So I get on a plane, I go to New York. And there's a premiere for a movie called Juice. And I go to the movie premiere. And after the movie, I'm looking for the Hutlands, except. I don't know what they look like. <laughs> and no internet, no Google, no nothing. So you can't no even nothing. fake it. I don't know. I don't even know who I'm looking for, man. Right, right. So I go to my friend, Andre Harrell, and I said, you know the Hutlands? Yeah. He says, matter of fact, there's Warrington Hutland right there. So I go up to him and I introduce myself. I meet his brother, Reggie Hutland. These are incredible people, by the way. For really sure. incredible. Yeah. And we meet them and we talk about it. And eventually i introduced him to kenny right and and i introduced him to clive davis uh because they wanted to know more about like our record label we know you guys are successful as producers but what about the record label this is a little different so right. clive came in and he was very supportive and um and they agreed to let us make a soundtrack for boomerang while we were in the theater watching the dailies of the movie that famous scene when Halle Berry says, love, what could you possibly know about love? Love should have brought your ass home last night. Yeah. And Kenny picked up on that. It was all, that was all him. He picked up on that and we went back home and him and Bo Watson from Midnight Star in my living room, I had a white piano in my living room. They went in and they wrote Love Should Have Brought You Home right there in my living room. And we took it to the studio and we recorded it with Anita Baker in mind. We thought this would be great for Anita Baker. Right. So we asked Tony to sing the demo. And she sung the demo for us and we pitched it to Anita Baker. Anita called and she said, baby, it sounds really good. I just don't think it's for me. And so I'm like, oh, damn, 
so let down. I called Reggie Hutland and I said, we can't get in either. He said, who's the girl singing the demo? Right, right. I'm like, oh, that's Tony Braxton. He said, let her stay on it. So we let her stay on it. And then we put her on another song called Give You My Heart with her and Kenny. Yeah. And we put and and both records got released and Tony Braxton's career was off and running. And it worked out just as I not planned. <laughs> I love it. I, I love I love to hear that story. You know, it's funny, like I remember being a Jack the Rapper the following year when you released her solo album and, and you had a luncheon in Atlanta. And man, y'all had it decked out. I was just a new kid on the block in the in the business. And um Tony was there and you had her perform in that moment. And it was just yes. like you had set it up like this is the next star. Like you had it was divine. And then another sad love song was just just that song was such such an amazing sounding song when you hear it on the radio. To this day, I heard it today on the radio and I was like, wow, this is such a this is a timeless song. And then that album, I mean, what did you go do? Like 10 million on her debut or something crazy like that? I think her debut album might have been around. Uh, I, I don't think it reached 10, um, but it was big, man. It was yeah. big. I, yeah. I don't even know. I'm going to say it was like six or seven million, but it was a yeah. big album. It she was. won the best new artist at the Grammys that year. Yeah. Um, and she was off and running, man, and um, yeah. and has never looked back, you know, and never. has has kept it up, too. You know, I'm really proud of her. Really happy. Yeah. And, I, her. and I would tell you that her second album is the greatest breakup album in the history of albums. I mean, like that's that album will touch your emotions from start to finish. It's just brilliant. Not a lot of people have a second album. They just don't. They don't have a first major album like this and then come with the second album that's like, oh my God, like, right? what are you, Michael Jackson? Uh, you, you must be Michael yeah. Jackson. That's the only person that could do that. Exactly. Yeah, that was, it was magical too, you know, and um. Yeah, it was crazy, man. Unbreak my heart and um Seven Whole Days. I love that song. Oh my mm. god. Yeah. And, breathe again. Uh, breathe again. It was crazy. Yeah. No, that was great. Crazy, so man. tell us about Usher. So you meet Usher, this 14-year-old kid. And at that point, had you ever thought about dealing with kids at all? I mean, the kid artist, you know, that's a that's a, a risky proposition in the music business. Um, but you saw something in Usher at 14. What was that? Yes. So, yeah, my brother Bryant um, went to a talent show um, by invitation to see another artist. While he was there, he saw Usher. And he called me and said, hey, man, you have to see this kid. So he brought Usher to my office. Usher walked in with his mother, Janetta, and he gave me his tape, right? And I put it in, and he started singing end of the road wow I said stop 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 I can't believe this and it's just myself there's only like two or three people in the room I walked down the hall I got everybody in the office to come in like I said I need everybody to come in and see this so mm -hmm. I got everybody in our office to come in and Usher did it again and he started doing end of the road he dropped down on his knee he started charming the girls in the room and when he was done, I was like, my God, I love this kid. And I said, welcome to LaFace. Signed wow. for it. It was just so like that. Was it your idea to send him to live with Puff while Puff was yeah. in the middle of Bad Boy? What, yeah. Tell us yeah, about that decision, because that, that was that was interesting at that moment. Yeah, so I met Puff. Um, I met Puff because the way I met him was uh, there was an article in one of the trades and in it, it talked about me and Face were breaking up. This is in one column. In the same article, in another column, it's talked about Andre Harrell was firing Puffy. Right. So I was like, it kind of spoke to me. So I called my assistant, Charlotte, and I said, do you know Puffy? She said, yeah. I said, can you set up a meeting? So she set up a meeting with me and Puff. He was in Atlanta at the time. I was in New York. He came back to New York. He took me to dinner at a place called Shark Bar. Oh, and, I love that spot. Right? And the Not point of the meeting, York. yeah, the point of it was that I was going to ask Puffy to become my head of A&R. But when I met him, I, I was like, oh, no, he's a lot more than that. 
Yeah. Like it was yeah. pretty obvious from day one, not only to me, but I think to everybody. It was like just so um instead we became friends and um he started helping me with stuff. You know, he helped me, he produced, I mean he directed the very first outcast video. Um, and he did all of the interludes on the TLC Crazy Sexy Cool album, right? And um yeah, so when I got Usher, I introduced him to Puff and and Puff had a lot of comments. So I said, well, why don't I just send him to New York to live with you so that you can like fix it up, record his album, produce him, teach him his swag, do your thing. So I always said I sent him to flavor class, flavor, flavor school. I sent him mm -hmm. to Puff Daddy flavor school. So at 14 years old, this kid moves to New York to live with Puffy in the middle. It, yeah, in the midst of that chaos of Puffy's life and him starting yeah. Bad Boy. But, but yeah. you know, I, I always say Usher's first album is underrated. I like this first album. Can you get with it? Like, he, yeah. he had a couple he had a couple gems on there. But then that second uh, album hit, and you guys were just like, rock it. Rock it. Yeah. Shit. But the first album was intentional. I didn't want um, – I wanted, I wanted Usher – to have an album that made him cool. It wasn't so much about getting a big hit. It was really like, I knew that Puff would know how to make an album on Usher that would work in New York. Right. And I wanted him to have that New York cool, right? Uh, it was more about that. And I just wanted him to sort of pick up, pick up on that charisma and pick up on, pick up on, 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 on that swag, you know? And it was, and that was accomplished. But uh, the song was uh, "All the Time I Think of You." That was my song on that album. That was That's a good the one. Song. I yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So it really, it really worked out, man. And um, yeah, and I took Puff to meet uh, Clive Davis, and um, got Bad Boy going. You know, yeah. so you know, so he helped me, and I helped him, and we just lifelong friends. So um, the, the one last artist on the face, watch. So well, two. Um, outcast because you didn't have any hip hop on the label. So, what what was it that you knew about? What did you see in Outcast and these two iconic creative guys that you thought you could put that LaFace uh, magic on? So it, it started out as um, I met um, Sleepy Brown. Uh, my wife introduced me to Sleepy Brown, and um, uh, he played me some songs that he had done, and I was like. This is you? And it was, the songs were sounding incredible. The production was incredible. And so I just struck up a relationship with, with him and, and his members of Organized Noise. So the first act they brought us was an act called Parental Advisory. Mm -hmm. And they made an album sounded really good, really good, and produced by Organized Noise. And Pebbles had a label. So she said she wanted that one. For her label so i was like okay cool you know you introduced me to the guys is only right then the second one they brought me was outcast they brought these two kids in they were still in high school they came into my office they auditioned for me in the office they were so young shy and i looked i thought it's pretty good but mm, not so sure wasn't sure yet it wasn't about hip-hop i didn't pretend to know hip-hop at that time, it was just music for me, artist and music. And um, and then they came back a second time and they auditioned. And I said, you know, it's better, but I'm just still not sure. So the third time, they said, no more office auditions. You need to come see us. So they set up a showcase in Atlanta. I show up at the showcase. They have they have their friends there. The room is nice, is a nicely, nicely lit room, you know, dimly lit room with a stage, sound system, and probably easily 40 people, easily, right? Mm -hmm. Go on stage and they crushed it. They crushed it. And then I was like, okay, yes. So signed them to the face. They went in to make their album. And I didn't listen to their album through a hip hop lens. Although they were rappers, they were very musical. And the production was very musical and they had a very strong point of view. They didn't use samples. Everything was originally, everything was played. 
like live. It was just incredible. It was right? clean, so, yeah. So my love of them was the level of musicality that they had. And they were great rappers. And I didn't know a lot about rappers. Um, I, I mean, I'm in part of the culture, so I know enough, but I wasn't, I hadn't signed anybody. Um, but I loved them. And when I went, once we signed them, all I ever did was had conversations with them. Like, you know, what do you think about this song? Well, here's what I think. And I remember the first album, I went in to master it and I helped sequence it. You know, that was about as much musical involvement as I had. I had nothing to, they were just great, man. They were really, really great. And I would I would make recommendations like maybe we should mix this again or do this or do that. Uh, but they were very much their own thing. Um, and so I felt my job more than trying to help them with music. My job was to mag amplify it, blow them up. I had to figure that out. That was the hard part. The easy yeah. part was signing them because they're great. The hard part was, OK, how do I blow them up? They're from Atlanta. It's hip hop, never done this before. Who do I even call? Where does this start? You know, so I just did my homework, found an incredible promoter in New York. His name was Sincere, brought in Sincere. He started laying the groundwork. Then Shanti Das from La Face, yeah. she came up with like great marketing and, and went out on the streets and started just like passing music out and doing their marketing campaigns. And we just stayed at it, man, until it worked. We just, we, everybody just worked that and they were always incredible kids they would never you know they wow you have outcast on your wall man look at that you got the first album on your wall i'm looking at it right now oh you, you see it oh you yeah, see it man. reflection of it yeah it's over here yeah oh yeah, yeah. i see yeah. the i see the first album that's incredible yeah. man. Yeah. yeah yeah um yeah and yeah so they that's all it was we worked really hard they were great i didn't know that they were as great as they were right I knew they were great, but I was closer musically to Tony and TLC and Usher, right? Um, and, and some other acts, but but as time went on and they started to morph into themselves, I was like, oh my God, oh my God. And it just kept growing and growing and growing, you know? And when I when I made the switch, which I'm jumping forward, but I made a switch obviously from La Face and started running Aris to Records just as they were making stink on you they first they made a greatest hits record with a song called the whole world and then they made stink on you and stink on you was like that was their classic album yeah that was a great sorry, album sorry miss jackson bombs over baghdad like yeah that was their classic they were, album. They were rock stars you know yes. out of the south but i, I will yeah. tell you la i remember you threw a party for them it was a gold party in the summer when that first album came out and it was at, I don't know if it was at your house or whatever, but I remember a drunken Biggie and um, uh, P Diddy were on stage uh, performing at this party. And I, and I just could, could see it in their eyes, man. Like how much you yeah. guys believed in them and how Atlanta believed in them. That was a, they were such a big deal, mm -hmm. you know, to be honest, they're really the bur the gatekeepers of Atlanta hip hop or outcasts. They were the first real superstars of rap out of Atlanta. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there were there were a couple of um, on the Atlanta front, like it started Atlanta started with. Crisscross and Arrested Development. That's true. Crisscross. Yeah. And the rest. You're right. Right. So they were they were they were a more of a I'll say it a more of a hardcore hip hop group. Yeah, they were real. They were a real hip hop group like, you know, a Crisscross exactly. was a little pop and the rest of development was was different. But right. they were like. They changed the game okay. for a lot of rappers out of the South. Yeah, you felt the streets, man. You felt yeah. it, right? Yeah. And and um and then and then the goody mob joined us. Oh my god. Right. With CeeLo. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They do and and then soul at that food. point, yeah, man. Soul food cell therapy, man. Oh and uh boom, 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 boom. The visuals for their uh, videos were amazing. Insane. Yeah. Insane. You know, so yeah, man, I, I I have to say that I really felt like I got really lucky by being very open. Um, and I didn't I never looked at I don't see music in genres. I see 
music and and quality right and 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 in musicality i still see music like an artist would see music right and i hear music the way an artist would hear music i don't really think of it as like i, I get it i understand it and as a as a an executive i understand it but i remember playing songs even for you man and not knowing like is this black is it pop i, I don't know and Lionel Lionel right now will be like, yo, no, that, that's too pop, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, because yeah. I don't know the difference, yeah. you know. Right. Uh, you just love music, you know? no, but that's cool. Yeah, you love music. music. Yeah. So, and, so tell me this. So you, your L.A. Reed Babyface is great partnership. You had this amazing label, and you basically kind of give a little of that Atlanta thing up to go to New York to take over Arista. What was it in that moment that made you want to just basically disrupt? The, the career you were having as a producer and label leader yeah. to taking on a grandiose position and really replacing the person that helped put you on. What was that like in that moment? Um, it was um, bittersweet is the best way I could put it. It's bittersweet. Uh, Cause I did it. There was, there was some business, there was some, some business in the background of it that was sort of leading me to that decision. Um, it wasn't that I wanted to leave Atlanta. I never wanted to leave Atlanta. I didn't even want to move to New York, but the job was in New York, right? right. Um, uh, so I, I went there. I did have, and I and I had no dreams of running Iris the record. That wasn't that wasn't in, in the cards. And I had so much love and respect for Clive Davis, uh, but I was presented an offer. Basically, I was presented an offer that was a controversial offer, you know, which was basically to um sell the face records huge mistake and um <laughs> first mistake and and take over arista records uh and play replacing clive davis second huge mistake right and, and although i'm i'm very proud of my executive career i, I might have been able to get get there without having done either of those two things you know right. so um, we all, you know, we all have seller's remorse and things like that, you know, so, um, you know, it's, it's been a long time now. It's been it's been 22 years since uh, I took over Arista Records and, and sold the face. And even to this day, I still I'm, I don't look back that much. But when I do look back at it as from afar, I can see how those things were probably not the greatest decisions uh, for the overarching Atlanta community, for the music industry. Uh, and even reputationally, right? Um, it, so it was, there was some, there was some um, landmines in that decision. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, interesting though, you came in controversial to uh, Arister and then you kind of left controversial. You kind of like, they, you went through some politics there and, and the, the powers that be, typical powers that be not seeing the value, um, especially a value in a black man like you and all that you brought to the right. label. And you had a yeah. lot of artists that were mad about Clive when you came in, but when you left, a lot of these same artists were mad about you and the way and what happened right. to you with the situation. So I, I would say that that was uh, bittersweet. But one artist yeah. I want to ask you about is Pink because you saw something in Pink mm -hmm. that nobody else saw in that mm -hmm. moment. Um, and 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 I mean, I remember Pink personally. I'll tell you the story. I I worked at this. Uh, I used to host this grimy club in philadelphia called club fever and um pink I'm, she must have been 15 years old at the time i mean this is a white girl from suburban philadelphia this is a hood underground all kind of stuff happened in this club and she got up and sung um one night a mary j blige song and everybody was like what like you we were just like uh who is that and uh uh, she was a coach. She actually worked at the club too. I'm a coach check girl. So we would, you know, I would talk to her here and there or whatever. And then you like somehow come across her and uh, talk a little bit about what you saw in her. Cause that was, that that's an amazing, she was an amazing uh, history as an artist, but yes. what did you see in that moment. So um, that story is one day I'm literally walking the halls at LaFace and I walk past Sharon Daly's office and she's playing a demo tape. Sharon was an A&R coordinator and she worked for my brother, actually. And she was playing a demo. And I just stepped in. I said, what is that? And she said, this, these girls, this girl group from Philly, turn it up. 
you have a picture? She shows me the picture, and I'm like, they're white? Right, right, right. <laughs> wow. And I said, uh, I want to meet them. Can you get them here? And she said, yes, I'll get them. So she calls the manager. who there was Those were her relationships. She calls the manager, and the girls show up. And they're called Choice. It's right. Three girl group called Choice. They come into the office, come into the conference room, and they sing for me. And when they're done singing, Alicia, Alicia Moore, starts talking a mile a minute. How old are you? She said, I forgot how old she said she was, but she made it up because she was a minor. But she didn't want to have to get parental consent or whatever, right? right? So, but she was just talking, man. She was, but but what I'm noticing is all this charisma, right? And 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 how soulful she was. And I'm like, this girl's special, man. It's something about her. Um, and I just took to her. I really just took to her. And I think she kind of took to me in that same way. Um, and she sort of became like a daughter to me, right? So I, I asked her and the group to sign to the label. And they said, yep, we'll sign to the label. And um, they started working on their album. I think I asked her, yeah, I'll tell you what happened. So they performed at the Little Face Christmas party. And T Boss says to me, I don't like that group. <laughs> but that girl, yeah, that girl is a star. Yeah. I'm like, really? She's like, yeah, that girl's a star. So afterwards, I asked Alicia, I said, have you ever thought about going solo? And she was like, nope haven't thought about it and I'm not thinking about it now. Right. And just kind of dismissed it, but I kept nudging at her like, you should go solo. Right. And then, um, she called me one day and she says, I'm taking you up on your offer. I'm, I'm going to go solo. I'm going to try this by myself. So she comes up to my office and she's a different person. When she was in choice, she had dreads, right? And she came to my office and she's cut all her hair off. It's hot pink. And she's got a pink rabbit's foot on a keychain. She throws it on the desk and she says, my name is Mr. Pink. And I was like, lose the Mr. Keep the pink. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Pink yeah. was born. Right. Yeah. And so we took some of the songs that she recorded with the group. They became her songs and we kept recording until we got one we loved. So Candy, um, Candy and Shakespeare recorded the song called There You Go, which was a little bit. They they also did TLC's No Scrubs for us and they yep. did Bills, Bills, Bills for Destiny's Child. So they came up with a song for Pink and I heard it and I was like, OK, there it is. There's our single. And um we connected her with dave myers made her first video and she has never looked back and yeah. became and became just a world-class star selling out arenas you know i mean it's selling out stadiums in in australia i mean she became a big star and she kept yeah. growing as an artist too you know and so when it came time to make her second album she presented it some of the songs to me and i remember saying you're kind of abandoning this thing you started. Like, you know, you're the white girl that has like the black audience. Right. And you're starting to starting to, to switch. You, sh you sure? And she's like, yeah, I'm sure. I was like, okay. And she was right. And I was wrong. And Misunderstood came out. And Pink got her first Diamond album. And yeah. A, a, su a true superstar was born. And what I learned from that was Unless they're dead wrong, listen to the artist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's what I do. I listen to the artist. Yeah. So again, you had staggering success at Arista, and then then you end up leaving Arista. Mm -hmm. Is it true that within forty five minutes of you leaving Arista, you were got the job at Def Jam that quickly? It's the truth. Yes. And you made your mind up that quickly. Um. Yeah. First of all, I was in a panic. I got fired. I mean. But I got fired at the craziest time, man. I got fired and had um, I had Ushers 8701 had already come out and I was making confessions. And I had Outcast Speaker Box Love Below. 
Pink's Misunderstood. And I'd signed Avril Lavigne's her first album called Let Go. Yes. So I have I have four artists that are d- damn near diamond. I couldn't be hotter. Right. Seriously. I couldn't have been hotter. And I got fired. And I was like, whoa. Okay. So I leave. And my lawyer says, Doug Morris wants to see you right away. I said, okay, cool. Can I go home and see my wife first? He said, yeah, but get to that office. So I got to his office within 45 minutes of being fired. And and the first offer he gave me wasn't Island Def Jam. He said, I'm going to make you the deputy chairman of the Universal Music Group. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I, don't know what that I still don't know what that is. Right, right, right. right. Sounds but, big, though. It sounded big. And I loved Doug. I loved that man, right? And I shook hands with him and I said, okay. And I got a couple of other offers too. You know, I had a couple of people reach out to me, um, but I had already sort of shook hands with Doug. So as it turns out, Leo Cohen, who is incredible, really yeah. incredible, uh, he had left Island Def Jam on his own accord. He left and and it just coincided with me leaving Arista. So my first offer was the deputy chairman position. And that, so I was like, okay, that weekend I went to Miami just to like decompress and I'm driving in the car with one of my friends, Shakir Stewart. He and I are driving out to go have breakfast. And I get a call from Jimmy Iovine and Jimmy Iovine says, where are you? I'm in Miami. He says, well, you need to get back to New York really quickly because Leo Cohen just left Def Jam. And and you are the first, second, and third choice for that position. Right. But you got to go see Doug. So that Monday, I went back to New York and went to see Doug. And that's when he actually offered me the um, chairman of Island Def Jam Music Group. Yeah. And, and so I took it. Like, I took it. And you know what I didn't know? I was in a daze. First of all, at LaFace, and I'm, I'm, I'll make this really quick, but at LaFace, I'm a, I'm a producer. I'm a musician. I'm just leaving a band. I've never worked in a record company. I've barely visited any record companies. I know nothing about record companies. So LaFace was like my learning ground. Um, so when I went to Arista, all of a sudden, I was no longer at a boutique company. Now I have a full on marketing staff, promotion staff, sales staff, distribution team, you know, my everything. And I worked there for three years and I kind of learned the ropes. But um, so when I went to Island Def Jam, I actually thought this is how sometimes how bizarre life is. I thought it was a little bit of a step down. I didn't know. I didn't realize that the culture of Def Jam was so powerful. I didn't realize that the culture of Island Records was so legendary. I didn't right. think about any of it, man, because I grew up in the world of, of uh, first of all, at, at LaFace, I was in the Arista orbit, right? So that was my world. And I really didn't pay attention to what anybody else was doing. So I, it wasn't that Def Jam was a step down it was that i didn't pay attention to it it didn't right. register to me right it was its own monster huh it was its own monster yeah i just yeah. didn't know right yeah. um i knew some of the songs i knew some of the artists i knew the names of course i knew russell i knew rick rubin i knew Leo cohen uh kevin lyles i knew everybody but i did, just didn't pay attention to it i had my right. own little orbit you know right and so when i stepped into it only after i took the job did i realize the magnitude of it and and how important it was culturally um and yeah so that was a crazy transition so the so the lat so i leave in my first week at def jam um they uh the arista team i think it had morphed into jive or something at that point yep they dropped they dropped confessions an album that i just finished it comes out of sales a million copies in the first week and again, bittersweet because I absolutely oversaw the album as my guy right. Usher, 
Uh, I executive produced it and it was very, very hands on. There were other people involved, obviously. There was a lot of producers involved, A&R people that helped. It was a team effort, but I was the leader. And I'm watching one of my proudest accomplishments come out and it has nothing to do with me. The song, yeah, I actually put out before I got fired, by the way. I put out, yeah. 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 And and yeah started to explode. Um, hadn't fully exploded, but it was on its way. And and so in my first week that comes out. In my second week, uh it's the Kanye West college dropout album. His debut album, yeah. His debut album, right? Yeah, which was all done prior to me joining um mm -hmm. Def Jam, right? So I'm experiencing two crazy things. I'm watching my success across the street take place. And I'm watching what I would consider like Leor's work, so to speak, along with Dame Dash and Jay-Z and Biggs. I'm watching their work take place, although but the leader is gone. Leor is gone. Right. So it was just a crazy moment. Like, OK, I'm inheriting Kanye West as I'm saying goodbye to Usher. So I had no, I just, and, and a couple years later, you find a young lady named Rihanna. I yes. mean, yes. you have this thing, you find an artist or you connect with an artist and you you get really excited. I know this because we I've, yes. I've had mo several moments with you early in an artist's career where you're just like, man, you're bouncing off the wall. You're like, I need you to hear this. I need you to hear it right now. And exactly. so tell us a little bit about Rihanna. What was it about Rihanna that you heard that you just felt like, oh, my God, this is this is a special artist. So Rihanna was interesting. Um, I'm, I was in my office one night. Um, I always worked at night. I listened to music at night. Jay Brown came in and he said, I want you to hear something. He puts in a CD and he plays Ponder Replay. And my reaction was, it sounds pretty good. Sounds a little bit like reggae. I don't know that much about reggae. Right. And I said, take it to Jay-Z. Right. And he took it. To, Jay had joined as president by then. Right. And, with, um, and that was part of your transition. You you made him president of Def Jam. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because and, and my reasoning was because I really felt sort of a backlash from uh, hip hop community in New York. And um, I was like, OK, I got to fix this. So my really good friend, Mariah Carey, she says, I'll tell you how you fix it. I was like, how? She said, hire Jay-Z as the president. All the problems will go away. I'm like, really? And just as she says that, Jay Z comes into the office. I'm like, whoa! Now I'm thinking that this is choreographed, this planned, or what? Yeah. Right? Either way, yeah. I thought it was a great idea. Yeah. And I, I spoke to Jay and asked him. We went out and asked him if he would join us as president. And he didn't answer right away, uh, but eventually he did take the position as the president. So while that's happening, uh, Jay Brown comes in uh, with Jay Z, and he brings in Rihanna, and I heard it and I liked it, but I really didn't know that kind of music. Like I, I just, you know, again, I had my own orbit and I hadn't grown up yet, you know. Um, and when she came in to audition, Jay came to my office and he says, you gotta see this. So I went in and she auditioned for me with all of us in the room. And I was like, don't let her leave. Do not let her leave. Mm -hmm. And and that was it. She got signed and I wasn't involved at first. Um, so uh, Jay-Z, Jay Brown, Ty Ty, they made the album. They made the first album. They made the second album. I only got involved when um, the song that got me, that moved me was she did a song called SOS. Oh, yeah. Massive. And, and that's when that's when it really hit me. I mean, I liked her in the very beginning. And I and I can tell you that I endorsed it um, and it was on my watch, but it was largely the work of 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 Jay and Jay Brown and Tata. Right. Yeah. Um, but after SOS. I got bitten by it and I was like, OK, I got to get involved. I got to get involved here. Right? right. So then I started to have a friendship with Rihanna and start spending time more time with her. And um, eventually we made um, Umbrella. Massive umbrella blows up and and then i i then i take a more hands-on um uh role and finding material for her and 
and just building a relationship with her and really sort of overseeing marketing and and uh and a lot of the decisions and the direction and we grew and grew and grew man and we we ended up making like the loud album together and and then we did um a large we worked on rated r together we, you know we did a lot of work together but it was uh I, I think the reason i'm saying it that way is because it was highly collaborative right and i i and it was um special she's a special girl yeah really really special girl really just the coolest has the best taste in music um yeah incredibly talented um very self-assured just cool always cool you know and i love her man i love rihanna she's yeah. incredible and then you you know you had kanye who after his debut album he had two uh, several more amazing albums oh on Def Jam. So and, proud then, of that. and then you have an artist named neo who like literally you you yep. grabbed and sprouted yeah. you know so you, you gave Def jam an r b a musical side that they didn't necessarily consistently have when you got there. yeah it started it definitely started to reflect my taste right mm -hmm. because it was um because i didn't understand what it was made of you know uh so i could only make the decisions based on my taste in music at that point you know yep. so it started to morph right it started to become well you know we still had young jeezy and we had rick ross you know but artists like rihanna and neo and justin bieber and 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 even Kanye West, who obviously was there when I met when I came to the company, um, but I did put my arm around him. I thought he was the most incredible artist alive. I still do, um, and um, like uh, amongst the greatest of the greats, you know, like I place him right alongside Prince, Michael Jackson, you know, uh, Whitney Houston, different kind of talent, right? but same caliber of talent uh one of the world's greatest and um and i really enjoyed it and we did we did a lot of work together man from i mean the first album they did you know i had nothing to do with it but then i got more and more involved as time went on you know so when we did late registration then graduation then 808 then dark twisted and the last thing i worked on was watch the throne yeah so you yeah. spent a couple years at def jam and then you leave Def Jam and you go to Epic, which at the time when you got there was dead. There was just it was a yeah. great name. It had Michael Jackson and Luther Vandross and Sade, but it was like it, nothing. It was like really, yeah, yeah. you know, what was your inspiration to go to that label in that moment? Because it just there was nothing. The cupboard was. It was there. really. It wasn't anything about the label. Um, I, I. It wasn't the label. It was uh, Doug Morris who brought me into Universal was leaving to go to Sony. And I was like, I got to go with you. We'll figure it out. And the first conversation was about RCA records. And he was like, okay, you're going to be the chairman of RCA. I was like, okay, cool, 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 cool. What about Epic? What, what are you doing with Epic? And I don't know, we're going to figure it out, he says, right? Next conversation, we're talking about RCA records. And I bring it up again. What about Epic? And he says, I'm offering you RCA records and you keep asking me about Epic. Yeah. 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 And I didn't realize I was doing it. Right. And I don't, I had an affinity for it without knowing it. Um, and, and at the time I was on, um, um, X factor, I was on television. I did two yep. years on television, um, uh, while I was building Epic. Um, and so it kind of worked out because I was kind of doing two things at once, you know, TV is full-time work. So trying to build a record label and be on television was like a lot of work. So eventually I gave up television and really mm -hmm. focused on the label. Uh, but in my first, my first year, I signed Future, right? With Benny Pugh. And um, yeah, and it took a few years for Future to become the superstar that he is now. But mm -hmm. I signed Future and um signed a lot of acts from from x factor they didn't work work out so well and then we the second major signing was travis scott right and proud of that one too you know he's right along that same lineage as outcast kanye west 
Travis Scott, you know, mm-hmm. um, and um, yeah, man, we just started first couple of years were rough. Then it started to turn around and we started having a lot of success. By the time I left, we had 21 Savage, French Montana, DJ Khaled, Future, Travis Scott, and a handful of really successful pop acts, Megan Trainer, Fifth Harmony, Camila Cabello, um, and some rock acts, uh, the Congos, A Great Big World. Like, so yeah, I was really proud of it. I, I, I have to tell you, I was proud. When I got there, it was it was definitely only a name. And by the time I left, they had a full-on roster, multi-genre successful roster. So they say you're supposed to leave a company better than you found it. So in each of those cases, I feel like yeah. I've done my job. You know, yeah. because each of those companies are were more successful when I left than they were before I got there. Yeah. And then you decided to start your own thing. You decided to do your to, to step away from all the big labels and start Hitco. Tell us a little bit about Hitco. Yeah. So uh Hitco is an interesting chapter for me because uh of all the things I've done in my career, whether it was as a, an artist with the deal or whether it was with Kenny with LA and Babyface or LaFace Records or my Arista chapter, my Island Def Jam chapter, or the Epic chapter. Um <clears throat> I'm going to say this in the most humblest way. I only, I just kept winning. Even though I had like tough moments getting fired and stuff like that, but I just kept winning. And Hitco represented the first time I didn't win. It's the first time, right? So I kind of look at it as it was a lesson, right? It was a, it was a, uh, a humbling experience and it was a lesson. And all the things that I learned from it are preparing me for the things I'm about to do. Right. So uh, that's about as much as I can say about say about Hitco. Right. It's just it was the toughest. It was the most difficult time in my life. Very tough time for me. And um, um, and I stunk up the place. That's how I feel. Right. I, but, you know, it's, it's not I was, easy. I was Michael. Jack, I was Michael Jordan on the Washington Wizards. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not easy, L.A. I mean, it's not that's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy to do what you've done several right. times. Yeah, to do it one time is amazing, but to do it several times, it's very difficult. Um, yeah. So w- when you w- w- we're about to wrap, and uh, and again, I really appreciate this time and you just sharing oh, these I stories. I appreciate it, man. Thank you, thank you. This is fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, you think about you know out of all of the artists that you work with, you know what was what's that one artist that like you know to this day, man, you still like, oh man. If I only like like uh, you had them and you there was there was something there, but it just didn't work out, and then you, and then you ended up somewhere else. Is there? Do you have an artist that got away? Uh, the one that got away would be Lady Gaga. I wow. signed Lady Gaga. I signed her to um, Island Def Jam. Um, she came in and she auditioned for me, and I thought she was remarkable. And I signed her. And according to her, I told her that she would change music. I said, "You're a very important artist, and you will change." The direction of music and um after i signed her and heard demo tapes i didn't like the demos that i was hearing by the way it wasn't the music that she became famous for it was before she got there yeah. and i didn't i didn't really have the patience to really like stick around for it so i said you know it's probably not for me so i gave her a release and she got a deal at interscope and she tells me that that was the change for her that she needed it. She said that was that was the push that she needed to really f- sort of find herself. So there was a silver lining in it, but definitely a regret. Um, uh, there are probably some others that I've met that I don't even remember meeting because I've, I've really like when I comb back through my history, man, I've met so many artists. I almost can't remember, you know, uh, but the only notable one that got away was um, was Lady Gaga. But the ones that I encountered were far more amazing to my experience, you know, right. whether it was Nas or whether it was, uh, you know, uh, Nas and Jay-Z and, and Kanye West, man, and Young Jeezy and Ross and Outkast and Goody Mob and Future and Travis and 21 and, and you know, like just remarkable, remarkable experiences. So, you know, I think, I think for my own mental health, I, I like to focus on the wins. I like to take lessons from the losses, but I like to focus on the wins and and try to see what they have in common and 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 
you know, I'm up to the task of doing it again, man. Yeah. Well, I always tell people, um, especially people get into the music business, people want to be, you know, they look at you and they see, you know, all the things you've done. That's you got to your guys' book. So the one thing I learned about you in the book was that, you know, the circumstances around you leaving your jobs, a lot you would look at it and be like, it's really unfair. It doesn't make any sense. Like just, right. and, and you were really, and you actually, I didn't even have to bring it up. You kind of just talked about a little bit about your success and then having to lose your job. So even when you're at the top of your game and you were just killing it, something can come along and like screw with it. Right. And yeah, sure. you persevered through that. A lot of people in this business got get crushed by moments like that. They can't yeah. handle that, but you got stronger and better and you figured out a way to get to whatever was next after right. after a moments like that and i i was i was very admirable reading that in the book because it's to me it's super inspiring because this stuff can really dig at you man you know, you know this business yeah. can dig at you things moments bad things that can happen can really stop your progress yeah it, and it, and it's it, you know what makes it tougher is for people like you and people like me we 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 create a name for ourselves that's sort of public facing yeah right and i think that that makes it even more difficult because people can draw people have a, an opinion of people that are, are are um you know standing out if you stay under the radar it's very safe under the radar yeah it's very safe but when you stick your head up somebody wants to take it off man you know and yep. And, yep. and so there's a lot that comes with success and uh, there's a lot that comes with success that's difficult. There's a lot that comes with failure that's difficult. Um, and you got to be built for both. You know, my champion, the people that I admire, you know, I, I actually have more admiration for like athletes, you know. So I, I love Kobe Bryant. Like I love Kobe and I love Jordan, you know, um, and I love LeBron. I, I love I love I love I love athletes because they they have to do it in front of a, a camera. They have to compete in front of a camera, ankles swollen, fingers broken, and they still persevere and they still win championships, you know? So I'm like, okay, so I'm dealing with politics, but my arm's not broken, my feet are not broken. So I don't have no excuse except to get back up and do it again, man. Yeah. If Kobe Bryant can win a championship with a sprained a sprain finger, I'm like, well, I, so what? Okay, I, I've been dealt some difficult blows, but hey, par for the course, you know? You yeah, want to, yeah. you got dreams you have to deal with some big issues you know so um i just don't let it get to me kobe i just i'm like okay another challenge another challenge another challenge yeah. you know yeah. but i'm built for it yeah. <laughs> you know, well, built for it, la i am so and and creativity is a, a commodity and it, yes, and sir. it's something that you have to nurture and and it sometimes it comes and goes right but you That's seem right. to have a creative spirit um that will live on for you know, thousands of years, man. They're gonna look back at, at the artist and the music, and and when you think about what I just said, like thousands of years from now, people will be connecting and thinking about these things that you put together that kind of came out of your mind in collaborations with other creatives. Right, that's amazing, yeah. man. I'm proud of that, man. I'm really, really, I'm really, really proud of that, and uh, and feel very honored, and very blessed, and I'm also very honored to have this time that I just spent with you. You know, and at some point. We have to do a role reversal because I want to hear your story. I want to sure. hear, I want to hear that story, man. You know, for sure. You've been doing this for a number of years, also, and you're still on top of the game and still making really, really important cultural decisions. You know, so you know, as 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 an, as a cultural impactor from one to another, I salute you. Well, thank you, my brother, L.A. Reed.